Okay, so it's my turn. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation by architect, not architecture. And uh, today I would like to show you two very important experiences through my architecture path. Uh, they're actually very tightly relating to the two places I listed uh, in my title of the presentation. One is the North Gate, it's actually referred to my first university in Beijing, Tsinghua University. Another one is the Cornfield, which refers to my university in the United States, which is the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, there's one thing I'd like to address is that instead of showing photographs, today I'm going to use drawings and paintings to share my uh, experience. I used to draw a lot and I keep on doing so till today through my architecture practice. It's, it's almost become a parallel continuous line alongside architecture. All right, so the first story is the Tsinghua North Gate. This picture was taken about 30 years ago. And this is the area right out of the north gate of the campus. Back to that time, it's still a very rural, primitive farmland with some very tiny villages scattering around. But now it's already very different, uh, occupied by a lot of dormitory buildings because the entire area right now is belonging to Tsinghua campus now. It's a kind of urbanization process, very typical in China through the past 30 years. And I have to introduce you this guy, um, Professor Hong Zhi Zhou. He was my teacher of the art course when I was in Tsinghua uh, University Architecture School. Back to that time, uh, as an architecture student, we have to take art course. For example, uh, pencil drawings or watercolor drawings but because we're not fine art student. So the training is more uh, towards uh, a kind of skill of painting or rendering rather than the pure artistic expression. Uh, but Professor Hong, Zhou Hongzhi, he wanted to do something different. He actually selected a very small number of architecture students among the, the whole school, no more than 10 people, to form, a, we call this an art group, a very tiny group. And then he took us out of the campus to the North Gate area of the school every weekend, mostly uh, on Sunday. And he asked us to draw on the real site surrounded by the natural setting. So back to that time, it's, it's the farm field, uh, very primitive and very powerful. For me, I think it's the very first threshold to really contemplate what the real art is about and what is the relationship between art and artist, the art and architecture. Because normally uh, when we're on the site, Professor Joe will ask us to really observe the site, to see the space and to feel the space and to express the, the true emotion and the mood. It's very different than the training we received inside architecture school. So for me, this is almost like a turning point through my learning process. And this is a series of drawings. You can tell it's the same piece of field, but we have to draw it over and over again. Of course, in the different climate, different time and different mood. But with this kind of uh, training, it's really helpful uh, as I reflect it now to start establish a kind of emo emotional connection between myself and the, the space surrounding me or the site. And it might be very crucial even for my later architecture practice because every time when I go to a site, I think it's the sensitivity of an architect, how you observe 
the site and how you uh, discover and how you learn from the site. So this is a series of uh, drawings I did back to that time. I still remember this one. It's right after a pouring rain and we just quickly pick up all the gear and then went to the field to, to capture that the last minute of the sunset while the cloud is still flying around the sky. And we, I use watercolors, I use ink sometime, and use pastels as well. So it's, this is also showing you the same village, but you draw it from different angles and over and over again. It's, it's really a, a very meaningful learning process for me. That's a funny picture. Uh, Lyndon might know that the guy on the left, Wally, who, who is uh, also a very uh, important architect now in China. At that day, I just finished one of the paintings and came back to the dormitory and met these two guys. They just finished their commercial renderings. They get quite a lot of money from that. So we took a picture together. Uh, this by charcoals. So you might feel that there is some, uh, some uh, impact by the impressionist because it's almost the same way of drawing to really go to the real site and to feel the air, the light, the atmosphere of the site and you draw it alive. That's been snow. And uh, within that period of time, uh, I remember it was 1996, also encouraged by Professor Zhou Hongzhi, I traveled to Tibet. Tibet was a kind of wonderland for the architecture students back, back to that time. It's not only for architecture students, it's for the entire culture. Uh, you know, this anybody related to the, to the culture and art, we dream to go there. And back to that time, it's still a little bit dangerous because of the cruel condition of the traffic or the living conditions. So whenever you, after you go to Tibet, you get almost like a warrior certificate. You know, you're, you're somebody. It's very different from now because the, the road and the airplane is very convenient at this moment. So there, there's a series of sketches and paintings I did in Tibet. They're all very quick because the weather there is very unpredictable. Sometimes along the process you're doing your, your painting or drawing, it, it will be raining or there will be a big storm. So they're all very fast, but it kind of, I don't know, it's very different than you just take a photo uh, in front of something. It's really get a much deeper impression into your mind and heart comparing you just to take a photograph. Yeah. So these are all the drawings. And a year later, after I come back from Tibet, I did some in-house painting and drawing based on some photographs I took throughout the journey. So that this is a couple of the images. It's the in-house painting, but it's based on the, the, the memory of that journey. All right, so I moved to my second very important and influential experience, uh, which is the cornfield. Uh, it was uh, during 1999 to 2001, which I had my second master degree in University of Illinois, the Urbana-Champaign. It's in the, in the middle part of the United States. And uh, if you know that school, you might uh, know why I call this cornfield, because the entire campus is surrounded by a large area of cornfield. So I use this as a nickname of that place. And this is the second person I'd like to introduce. Uh, he is Professor Henry Plummer, and uh, he eventually became my thesis advisor uh, during that two-year program. Well, I cannot uh, express my uh, grateful uh, feeling to him because before I went to that school, 
the education I received in Beijing about architecture is more about the practical part of architecture. For example, the program, the circulation, the form, the composition. But he is the guy who took me to another realm of architecture thinking. It's more about this intangible part of architecture, the natural light, the atmosphere, the ambience, the mood, and the time, which is very tightly relating to my today's uh, architecture practice and uh, architecture thinking uh, is still the very important and intriguing keywords for me today. And the first part of his program is an excursion study around Europe because I was an exchange student in Munich, TUM, which is a very good school in Germany. I stayed there in the summer semester and uh, I got a list from Henry Plummer. He pointed out all the important buildings I have to visit. So every weekend I have to travel around and then go to the building, particular building, and also use the hand drawing to record, to depict the very moment of the light condition of that building. So this is a series of sketches I did through, through that journey. Uh, this is obviously the, the Bregenz Museum by Peter Zomther in Vienna. And this is just a contour line lit by the natural light. And I stand against the light. It's in the English garden in Munich. So it's a very touching moment, which had a very uh, deep, I had a very deep impression with throughout this uh, travel. And this is a series of condition of light and shadow. Some of them are in the cathedral, some of them in museum. This darkness in a very uh, historical building in Vienna and very important, famous uh, plaza in Munich. And this is actually one day when I came out from school, I look at the wall, there is a shadow casted by the natural light. It's the tree, it's the same tree, but because the leaves are in different distance to the wall. So you, you start sensing the darker tone and the lighter tone of the leaves. So at that moment, I just catch that with my hand drawing again. And this is the tunnel, a very intriguing light moment in the Munich subway system. And the section of the subway, which, which is based on my imagination. And some specific moments of light condition. On the right side is the, is the Rongshan by Gorbu Zia. The church in Vienna, and the, on the right side again is Peter Zonther's uh, the temper installation in the Hanover World Expo in the year of 2000. And this is a very important museum in Munich, Pinakothek. And I study uh, different ways that light is filtered from this from the sky to the exhibition space by the section type of the architecture and uh, create a different kind of quality in the atmosphere of the space underneath. And the second part of his program is when I go back to United States, I have to finish uh, a design project, which is uh, a museum, I still remember, it's a museum along the Chicago River. And the name of the project, it's uh, a place of salads, just establishing a kind of certain ambience in architecture space with studying the light. So that's the major topic of that course. And again, all these drawings, all the renderings, presentations is by, by hand. This is a particular detail. It's one small light opening. And I study, use the hand drawings to study the different time and the light condition will change. So the texture, the, the ambience and the, the shadow will change as well. That's one of the corridors in the, in the museum. It's a meditation space, the darkness and the penetrating light and shadow, layers of walls. 
yeah, that's all the, the space in some uh, particular area of the museum. So for me, that's the two most important turning point. It really changed my path through my architectural learning process. So this is something I like to share, in with, share with you guys. And I started my own practice since 2008, Vector Architects, Zhixiang Jianzhu. And ever since, I keep on uh, carrying on this habit of hand drawing because for me, it's almost the most effective tool of architecture design. I have to correct myself. It's not only two, I think. I think my hand somehow is parallel with my brain. I, it's really not only a execution or a tool of my brain or of my uh, brain thinking. Sometimes I cannot even figure uh, who is leading who. My hand is for in ahead or my brain is ahead. So it's very uh, intriguing for me. But I think it's very inter uh, interlocking and interrelating relationship between my hand and the brain. This is a series of uh, sketches I did recently. Some of, some of them are based on the study of a site. Uh, use sketches to build up this kind of connection between architect and the physical surroundings. And some of them is the imagination of space, even before we have a scheme. So it really, it's a very initial atmosphere of the space. And some of them is very conceptual. It's not even showing you a clear configuration of the space. Yeah. And some of them are the, the research of some, uh, this is a historical building in, in China, a very famous temple. So hand drawing can make me to get some into a very detailed research of this historical information. And some of them are purely problem solving. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you a lot for your presentation. Appreciate your time, and we are very honored that you both are participating. That's a very nice presentation with so many drawings. I wish I could draw like that. That would be nice. But even at the university, I, I couldn't do that, that well. Um, that's very nice. Um, you mentioned how that how drawing being outside and having been the being passion um, outside and drawing help you to have that connection, the emotional connection with the site. And I remember uh, in, a, in a previous interview, you mentioned that, um, that you say that during the design process, there is a lot of a struggle. And I quote you, every project is a kind of a pain, painful process to me. What is it that brings you pain and struggle? Well, I think it's, for me, it's a very normal process because in the beginning, there's a lot of problems and issues you have to face and mm -hmm. it's all in your brain. And little by little, you try to interpret them and try to understand them. And for me, it's a chemical, it's a chemical reaction. I think the design is not like there's one problem, I solve this, and there's another problem, I solve that, mm -hmm. and add them together, it's becoming an architecture. Design is not like that. Design process, it's a melting process first. All the problem have to be diffused or melt in your brain, and all of a sudden, there is a good idea. You can make an inter integrated solution. So, mm -hmm. so it's very hard to predict when you can come up with that idea. But every time when you accumulate enough energy and time, sooner or later, that idea will come up. But throughout the process, for me, sometimes it's really struggle. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a very, it sounds like a very personal um, process for you. Um, how, do you. how do you share it with your team? At the office. We, have a, we have a certain way of uh, 
you know, how we try to push the design forward. For example, in the beginning, we do some site study, we do type of uh, typology study, and then step by step, uh, different architect within the team, they will try to think about their own solution. And then we talk about it, we discuss about it. And uh, in some cases, some of the idea from my team can really inspire me, but sometimes I have to purely rely mm. on myself. Mm. But anyway, it's a procedure, but again, it's hard to predict what moment mm. you have that feeling, you know, mm. there's a click, you know that I got it. I think this is the, well, this is the, the difficulty of architecture. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I also remember uh, um, in that interview that you mentioned that uh, the only way to achieve high level architecture is by taking it very personally and emotionally. My question is, how do you deal with setbacks personally and emotionally? A competition that uh, you don't win or a very interesting project that isn't being realized in the end? Well, of course, emotionally, that's a loss. And that sometimes is hurting. Last year, we were participating a competition in Shenzhen, which is a very uh, major city in China, but eventually we, we didn't get the project. It's normal. It's part of the life of, of architects. But we just mm -hmm. have to face it. Yeah. But you know, sometimes I think it's interesting whenever you come up with a specific idea, even though the project for some reason is dead. But that idea, it somehow will be rooting your heart and yes. that might affect some other project, even mm -hmm. though it's not literally using the idea, but this kind of accumulation process for architect is also a self-learning process, I think, which is, yeah. which is important, yeah. I, we had also similar similar um, answer to this to this question, and it's very nice, interesting that you take it with you this uh, this learning. What is um, where do you find the most joy um, about being an architect? <laughs> well, <laughs> Not that much big, joy. This is a big question, but I can I can tell you that uh, I think architecture has two different stage. The first stage is the architect design architecture. So there's a certain standard and the target, you have to approach it and you have to try to be as close as possible in order to achieve a certain quality for a specific architect. But the second stage of architecture is after the architect architecture started to be used by the regular people and the space will be engaging with you know people with the weather with the vegetation so it's a lot of factors very hard to predict by the designer but because in the recent years we have this experience to really you know uh, watch this process, it's, for me, it's amazing process. How, when you finish a space and you see the regular people, how they in, interact with the space and you see how the, the ring will wash the wall and this, this, get this patina in the material and you see how the vegetation will grow. For me, I think that's probably one of the most joys <laughs> as an architect to see mm. your architecture really grow, you know, so that's very nice. I, one last question that I wanted to ask is regarding your your upbringing in Beijing and how um, how your relationship with the Xinhua bad pronunciation Xinhua University uh, influenced you as a thinker, not only as an architect. Well, we of course there is a very fundamental influenced by that school. You know, the Tsinghua University is, is ranking number one architecture school in China. 
And the influence I get from that school partially is from the faculty, from the professor. And of course the professor Zhou Hongzhi I just mentioned, mm -hmm. but there's another very important influential power uh, from that school is by my classmates, by my friends. And mm -hmm. Lin didn't know that uh, actually during uh, the couple of years uh, older than me or younger than me when I was in school, many of the graduates right now, they're becoming great architects in China. And we, we talk to each other sometime, we discuss architecture or art or even, you know, some other issues. I think that's, that's a really energy uh, we stimulate from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we keep on growing and making progress, uh, which I really appreciate. Actually, Sang, Sang Ke is one of them, right? Um, I don't know, we studied together or almost? He's one year older than me and we're, we're really brothers. We're very close to each other when we we're in school. Uh, we actually live literally in the same courtyard. We all rent the, you know, a particular room within that yard. I still remember it. It's quite a, a joyful memory throughout my- That's Very school. nice. Um, I would like to, to uh, ask Lyndon to join the conversation so that we can start the roundtable discussion together.